G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. It is time to react to the predictions I made at the start of the year, the latter prediction. This is usually a video full of cringe and self-resentment about some of the calls I've made. And look, I've had a little brief look at it and I'm expecting some good calls and some bad calls. I'm quietly hoping this turns out to be maybe my best year of predictions, but there's still you know plenty I got wrong. So in this video, I'm going to play a clip of what I said about each team at the start of the 2024 season when I predicted where they're gonna finish, and then I'm going to react to how far off or how close I actually was. Let's get into it. And this is the bottom four that I expect to see in season 2024. So let's talk about the bottom two first, okay? So there's a, an immediate thing that's probably caught your eye and that's that I don't have West Coast being wooden spooners. Now, what's my main piece of logic for this? First of all, I'm, I'm somewhat confident that these will be the bottom two teams when you factor in how far apart they were from the next worst side in 2024, right? Now, why have I got West Coast above North Melbourne? Is there some sort of blind Eagles bias in that? You know, I, I don't really think so, but possibly. But this is my logic for it, okay? So I, I've been saying for the last few weeks on the channel that I've become increasingly confident that I just can't see North moving up the ladder too much in 2024. It is possible. But my logic for this is that they are pretty distantly the least experienced and youngest team in the competition. They've said goodbye to some veterans and look, their, their youth is fantastic. And it's interesting to compare North Melbourne and, and West Coast. And this is probably the way I'd simplify it. Which team is further ahead in their rebuild? I would say that North Melbourne probably are. When you consider the depth of young, amazing talent that they have, they've got more of those types than West Coast. And you could even argue that on exposed form that they're probably better. I'm happy to concede that. But what we're talking about right now is the strength of their best 22s. And when you factor in these two sides were so close, for the most part, they were close. Like West Coast obviously had some horrific losses, but West Coast have a lot more reinforcements in theory coming up into their best 22 that weren't fit for the last few years. So when you look at the strength of their best 22, which obviously relies on not getting decimated by injury, I think West Coast have North Melbourne covered. And I also don't think that West Coast have a glaring positional weakness like North Melbourne do with their back line. Richmond, again, this one could make me look silly for sure, but this is my logic for it. They're, they've got enough gun stars in their team to push up and maybe just linger around outside the eight. And that's why I've got such a big range for Richmond. But this is the thing that makes me not confident about Richmond. When we're talking about bottom four teams, right? Generally teams that finish that low, there's some sort of capitulation. There's some sort of injury crisis. It is usually a common trend with these bottom teams. Rarely will you see a bottom four team have a great run with injuries and still finish low on the ladder. And my logic with Richmond is that outside of their amazing stars, I, I think the, the middle layer of their list is what kind of concerns me. So I, I think they're more vulnerable than any of the teams I've got ahead of them. And that's why I think probabilistically, they're probably the next team that I have in this bottom four. Okay, so straight off the bat, that's a really good start, I think. Uh, the bottom three there were the correct bottom three teams, and maybe that's not a massive leap, but I'm comfortable with the order I put them in. I did really labor on why I had West Coast higher than North, because um, there was a lot of discussion between Eagles and North fans on this channel at that time. And yeah, that, that pretty much rang true. So it was a really good start. Richmond was kind of, you know, maybe not a massively bold call, but I think the things that I said in that video were right. And maybe, maybe the reason they finished 18th was because their injuries were worse than I could have forecasted. I said if they'd had injury adversity, they'd fall down. They had extreme injury adversity and fell further down, but pretty damn good start i would say as for hawthorne look this is still an improvement on last year there is plenty of reason for them to improve as well when you consider that the uh, forward line reinforcements that they've got they're a young list but it's that youth in particular that makes me not super confident so a 10th to 15th range that again i don't see hawthorne falling into the bottom three but they are super young and they're going to have a new forward line dynamic and i just don't see them seriously contending for finals but i could have this wrong but i'm being conservative on the hawks i think they'll move up the ladder by one spot and show some great form throughout patches okay so that good start is completely blown to pieces by putting hawthorne in 15th place look undersold hawthorne did anyone not undersell Hawthorne this year? I think I'm going to give myself a little bit of a break. Maybe I should have backed him in a bit more. I think it was clear last year they were so much better than the, the teams that finished below them, of which there was just North and West Coast. And at the start of this year, at round seven, it still looked like a pretty good prediction. It had them in, in the bottom four. Uh, nobody really could have seen that second half of the year coming from Hawthorne. So I won't give myself a complete pass because bottom four is a bad prediction. 
However, you know, the fact that I didn't have them in the finals, I'll give myself a break for that one. Just a heads up guys, this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Personally, I think the ability to talk to someone about what's going on inside your head may be the most underrated tool we have. Personally for me, I think one of the biggest benefits I get from verbalizing what's going on inside my head is that sometimes like thoughts or concerns that you have deep inside your mind kind of exist as these nebulous subconscious feelings. But when you actually say them out loud, when you actually have to articulate them into a sentence, there's plenty of times where I've found that that thought or concern that I had probably didn't actually make a lot of sense or was perhaps really irrational. And I didn't realize that until I had to formulate a sentence. So that's why I wanted to introduce today's paid partner, BetterHelp, because they're a platform that matches people with credentialed therapists who are trained to listen. The good thing about therapy is that it's a safe space. You know, there's no real fear of judgment. You get guarded help from an expert, an actual mental health trained professional. And I think people these days are really catching on to this idea that you don't need to be diagnosed with something like depression or anxiety to necessarily get a benefit from therapy. So if you want to get started in this process, you can go to the link in the description of this video, or you can simply go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. From there, you fill out a questionnaire, which helps them assess your specific needs. So it's easy to start and it's easy once you've started the process as well, because if you find a therapist that you perhaps don't feel like is the right fit for you, you can switch to another one at no additional cost. So if you're someone who thinks you could benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp, like I said, link in the description, or you can simply go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy, and that will get you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. In 12th, I have Gold Coast, 13th Fremantle, and 14th Essendon. So you'll see it by the ranges there that I think all three of these teams are a small chance to cram their way into the eight. And that makes them distinctly different from the bottom four. But I also see an enormous range with these teams. So Essendon, we've seen that their best form is decent. They've also had some really good reinforcements. But the part that makes me uneasy about Essendon is how poor they were in the last seven weeks of last year. And I, if there's Essendon fans out there that might take umbrage with that, I would urge you to go back and consider what you were saying about Essendon in the last seven weeks of last season. So I'm not coming at from this from a point of disrespect, but momentum is important. They could prove me wrong, but the way they ended last season makes me less confident than the teams that I have above them in this video. Fremantle could bounce back into the eight. I don't think it's super realistic this year. Look, good quality young list, absolutely. Um, I think some hinges on the fact of, can Andy Brayshaw return to being that MVP level quality midfielder? He probably can, he probably can. Hayden Young's gonna transition into a full-time midfielder. You know, Fremantle fans are confident of that being successful, but is it guaranteed? No. So I feel like there's a few key variables here that could see Fremantle dip up or kind of stagnate. And like I said, you know, I think if they didn't just lose their equal second goal scorer in a team that has kind of struggled to generate goals in the past, is it too much to rely on Michael Walters and Jai Amos having a great year in front of goal? I think so, at least to, to back them highly in these predictions. So I think Fremantle is building towards something good. It's about keeping this team together. I just don't think this is the year we see a big jump from Fremantle, but I do think a big jump is coming, but I'm just not confident at the moment. Then there's the Gold Coast Suns. I, I, I do want to back them in, and I do think they are a somewhat realistic finals chance, but certainly outside the batch of teams that I think will really get close. And ultimately, it comes down to the fact that a lot of their best young core players are still only 22 or 23. So I think the players that will really drive success and achievement in this group over the coming years, guys like Ben King, Raul Anderson, Flanders to some extent. They do have some older types as well. And when you look at the, the age demographic of their list, it's quite interesting because I think a lot of their best 22 and the players they're gonna be relying on are still kind of pre-prime and therefore you can sort of expect some inconsistency, but they're actually the sort of middle bracket for age and experience. But I think they've just got a lot of veterans outside their best 22. So I don't know if that's the best way to look at it. So I still see Gold Coast as a young team that's gonna be playing their first season under a new coach. Maybe they start poorly, maybe they end well, maybe it goes the other way around, who knows? But I just, I'm not gonna back in the Gold Coast Suns yet, but I do think that finals team is coming. I think it's pretty close. I just don't think it's gonna click in the first season. Okay, so I had Gold Coast 12th, Fremantle 13th, Essendon 14th. Essendon finished 11th, so three spots higher than that. Fremantle finished 10th, again, three spots higher than that. Gold Coast finished in 13th one spot below where I put them. That's not too bad. Um, obviously, I've got a few things wrong in each team. So with Essendon, I said, you know, I'm, I thought I made some good points in there. I was really concerned by the end of the season last year. And we saw a bit of an echo of that again this year with a fade away towards the end of the year. However, I still think that's an improvement. I've been fairly consistent on that with Essendon. I said, yes, they've fallen away. 
but in a weird way, they still have improved and they've still got a lot of work to do. Um, nonetheless, they still did better than I expected and they were in the finals race longer than I expected and generally did better. Same thing with Fremantle, I undersold them. Some of the points I highlighted were fair. I talked about some variables with Hayley, Hayden Young that ended up being a massive success really. Um, and their goal scoring concern that I had, you know, Josh Tracy blew out of the water this year, if that's a saying. But, you know, they, they did slightly better than I expected. I'm not a million miles off. Gold Coast, again, I did describe them as outside the batch of teams really going for finals. And I also said that their core best players are still quite young. And that's a decent call when you consider that they were bottom three for both age and experience this year in terms of selected teams. So not by list average, I think they were mid-tier, like if you average out the entire list, but they had a lot of veterans not playing week in, week out. So one spot off, it's not too bad. So I got the order wrong. I undersold Fremantle and Essen and slightly, but generally speaking, I have done a lot worse previously. All right, let's talk about the most controversial part of my ladder, where I've got a glut of teams that I, I wanted to include all of them in finals. So I'm gonna talk about the bracket from sixth to 11th. This is not a ranking of how I rate the teams. This is me deliberately trying to shake up the top eight and remove two teams that made it last year. And to be honest, I haven't shaken it up enough. I'm gonna show you on the screen now from sixth to 11th, all of these teams I think could play finals and wanted to include but you have to make tough decisions in a ladder prediction. So Melbourne and Port Adelaide are the two names that jump off the board there. They have two of the strongest lists in the competition, particularly Melbourne. I think with Port Adelaide, they've got a good team that's a little bit top heavy in terms of their best contributors. And another team that didn't finish the season well. And sometimes you take that momentum into next year. So I don't have a strong opinion. Like I do think Port Adelaide could finish third. You can see by the, the Rangers there, I think Port Adelaide and Melbourne could do it, but I am deliberately trying to pick two teams to fall out of the eight. And those two were the most likely to me. Melbourne is iffy for me too. This is kind of more of a bold prediction, but I'm just thinking, you know, Max Gorn is not really a young man anymore. And there are some aging stars in that team. I, the other thing that makes me a little bit concerned is the best version of Melbourne is when you have a really fit and firing Petrarca and Oliver. And with the uncertainty of Oliver this year, are they the same team if Clayton Oliver's not fully fit and you know mentally in the game? Obviously, best wishes to him. I hope, he, I hope we see him round one. I don't know how realistic that is. So I just think Melbourne are a little bit more vulnerable than some other teams. But you know, if they finish third, I think they're still potentially a premiership contender on list ability. So those are my rough calls. I also really wanted to include Geelong in this because they still have a really strong side on paper. They have really good forwards, really good backs, and a midfield that probably is a little bit of, uh, deficient in terms of depth. They're also great at home generally speaking. So I expect them to be better than last year and I could absolutely see them making the finals. But if I apply the same logic to, to what I've done with other teams here, I think they're vulnerable to some injuries again. So if Cam Guthrie, Tom Atkins, you know, these guys, these midfielders miss games and I think Geelong is going to be vulnerable again. So I couldn't quite put them all the way into the, you know, finals. Hmm, this part of the ladder is a little bit gross. So I had Melbourne Knight put Adelaide 10th. Geelong in 11th. I suppose to start with Geelong, um, again, some of the things that I said weren't horrendous. I, I highlighted the midfield as potentially being an Achilles heel and the midfield was pretty good and it, it actually became really good towards the end of the year. So I definitely got that wrong and undersold them. I said they would be vulnerable to injury. Well, they had a better injury run. Um, they far and away exceeded what I expected of them. So that's not a good prediction. I will cop that as a, as a bad call. And again, I feel like it's not the first time I've said this, but I'm done thinking Geelong rolling down the ladder. I don't think I was as hard on them as other people in the preseason, but at the same time, I can't claim there's a win. 11th is not a good prediction. As for Port Adelaide, again, this was not a particularly strong opinion that I held. Um, and I said that they were top heavy in terms of performance last year, or I think they did improve this year. That being said, you can only really describe it as a bad call. They finished second. I highlighted them as a team with potential to fall down the ladder. Bit of a rough call, but I'll cut my whack. Bad prediction by me there. Melbourne, this was actually not a too bad a call, but again, I, I didn't really have strong conviction about this, so there's only so much credit I can take. I really just highlighted them as a team with potential to fall. Max Gorn was a player I highlighted as, you know, he's not getting any younger. Well, he had, he had a great season. It wasn't him. There was tons of issues going on at Melbourne this year, uh, not least Petrarca missing a lot of football, but there was other things going on. I also laugh, I, I put their Rangers third to eighth in the video, and then I put them ninth or 10th or something like that. So that's funny. So I had two shots at a team missing the finals. I got Melbourne right, got Port Adelaide wrong, but uh, not a whole lot of quality analysis in that. So not too much credit I can take. The Bulldogs is a little bit of a bold prediction. Like there's, there's a lot of um, media narrative out there about the Bulldogs maybe falling away. And you can understand why, because of a listless end to the season a little bit, a couple of unconvincing years for a team that's more talented than what it's producing. Bailey Smith 
Smith just done an ACL. A couple of key players are aging. But as well, when you look on the positive side, there is some rejuvenation we could see from this team. While I'm not super confident on them because they've kind of underdelivered for a couple of years, I think the Bulldogs are probably more likely to get, make the finals than miss finals. So at the Bulldogs in eighth, I think this is actually a pretty good call. They finished sixth. I said they were far more likely to make finals than not. If anything, I undersold them a little bit because they finished two spots higher than I thought they would. Um, the team has looked different. I think they've transitioned really well. We've seen some new young guys bob up, in particular San Darcy. Jamara kicked the most goals he's had in a season. I backed him in for finals. They made it. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with that. It doesn't matter that I was a couple of spots off. They made the finals. Let's talk about the Crows and St Kilda. So firstly, the Crows. I'm not super sold on them making finals. And the reason is I can just think of so many other teams that also could make finals. So why am I less sold on the Adelaide Crows? Well, I think when you look at their team, if Tex misses footy, if Jordan Dawson misses footy, if they get another backline injury in the absence of Nick Murray, how likely are they to hold up under that sort of pressure? With a very young team, with guys not quite hitting their prime yet. You know, part of this analysis is me trying to make assessments of how vulnerable teams are to, to missing key players. And I do think Adelaide are vulnerable. That being said, the best football we saw from them is absolutely finals quality. Super dangerous forward line, good at home. That's a recipe for making finals. So they're one of my teams that didn't make the finals last year that I think will make it. Okay, so this might be the first real howler. Probably the worst howler. Not the first howler, but the worst howler. Adelaide in seventh. Now, probably wasn't really on my own. There's a lot of group think that Adelaide, considering the end of the 2023 season, would improve and go one step further. And they fell away pretty badly this year, albeit had some really strong performances and some bad ones as well. It was a weird sort of prediction in that video. I kind of made it sound really negative but ultimately put them in the finals. So, um, you know, some mitigating circumstances for Adelaide, perhaps a little bit over-reliant on a few, but they're also still really young. So bottom three for age and experience this year. That's actually a reason for optimism for Crows fans. This season didn't go as expected, but they were a very young team still, and I think they've got a bit of work to do. I overrated them, bad prediction. And St Kilda, I've got a really good feeling about St Kilda. Uh, there's something really compelling to me about teams that play a really cohesive and committed game style like the Saints do. And I genuinely think that probably transcends talent. And I do think they're talented. I really do think they're talented, particularly the youth. What will be the tricky thing for them is getting their senior players who are playing well now to keep playing well while their young players are still maturing and going to hit their straps over time. So I don't see them as a genuine premiership contender, but they could, you know, accumulate enough wins early to potentially go all the way to fourth. Like Max King. Max King's going to have a big year, I reckon. Secure is another, another howler here. Um, yeah, I thought they would finish in the same position they did in 2023. Although well, there's enough reason to, you know, they made finals. I rate the young crop. Um, they've added to that, you know, Darcy Wilson in particular was really good this year. And I think they continue to add to that. And it'll be interesting to watch them this offseason to see where their attention goes. Do they top up with top end experience or try to at least the link to Jack McRae as it currently stands? Or do they keep going through the draft? Maybe they're doing both. Um, either way, St. Kilda took a backward step. And I do think. Towards the end of the season, they showed some really good form, some really good wins in that stretch. Big win over Geelong. Um, they beat the Swans, of course. Beat Carlton in the final round. Um, yeah, the tough ones are rate. Uh, I can't say anything other than a bad prediction for this, but I'm tempted to back them in next year as well. So let's talk about the top five. And I, I think all these top five are probably my five best premiership contenders. So let's get, let's get it up on the screen here first. First thing that's going to flame you, Collingwood finishing fifth. Do I feel strongly about this? No. Are Collingwood probably the best team in the competition? Yes. But again, I am trying to mix this up a little bit and I can find vulnerabilities with Collingwood. I don't necessarily think Carlton is better than Collingwood, but do Collingwood have the same hunger next year? Can they really cover Dan McStay for an entire season? What happens if Darcy Moore goes down because he is by far and away their best key position player? I don't think they need to drop off too much more to finish fifth, potentially. You know, we're talking about maybe two less wins than last season. Aha, Collingwood. Now, this is a funny one because I got criticized by Pies fans, understandably. You know, it's all fun. But I do distinctly remember this being one of the more criticized aspects of my ladder prediction. Collingwood to slip out of the four. I only wish I'd gone harder on this opinion. Um, you know, there's mitigating circumstances, as there is with every team who falls down. At the end of the day, they started the season poorly. They had a winning streak where you could see that still the same Collingwood was there, then another little losing streak from memory and ultimately fell short and weren't good enough to play finals. But 
At the end of the day, I just wish I'd gone a little bit harder on Collingwood so I would look better right now. I've got Carlton in there. Obviously, I just, I've just i been talking about Paul Summer. I think the recipe is there for potentially long-term sustained success. When you look at their spine, you look at their role players, I think there's quality there. The midfield's firing. Sam Walsh, I think the way he ended the season, I find really compelling. And that's why I think I'm going to back in Carlton and I'm going to be bold with this prediction to at least make the four. Maybe that's not bold. I don't know. Are they absolutely locked in? No. But part of this prediction is to, you know, shake things up a little bit. I like Carlton for the four. Carlton top four, I was very optimistic on. I think there is some justification for that. And, you know, mid-year, that was looking like a good prediction. They're in the top two. And I thought genuine flag contender. Um, we all know what happened in the second half of the year. They unraveled. Some injuries coincided with that. Maybe, you know, sometimes it was due to the injuries like TDK going down hurt. Um, but other than that, I think they looked shaky before that too. So hard one to really diagnose what happened with Carlton this year, but they fell short of expectations. And uh, again, I overrated them, I suppose. But part of me thinks they should have finished higher. So I've got the top three teams, all non-Victorian. I don't know when the last time it was that that happened. The Sydney Swans, I think for them to go through a year last year where fitness was an issue, backline was decimated, for them to still make finals, I think uh, was a pretty damn good effort, to be honest. And I think if you extrapolate that healthier run, couple of reinforcements of a really good first choice ruck now, or at least a potentially good one, Taylor Adams comes into this side. And the continued progression of young players, like Roe Bottom finished high in their best and various, still like, what, 23? Chad Warner is still really young. Errol Goulden as well. He doesn't even need to get better. He just has another year like last year and others will improve around him. Logan McDonald's a year older. I just see the recipe there for Sydney to be a good, consistent team. Are they my premiership favorite? No, but I think they're in that mix. Sydney in third, I'm very comfortable with this because they actually exceeded what I said here. Um, and maybe that doesn't look like a big call, but they had finished eighth and went out in week one of the finals in 2023. And I just backed them to come back, which I don't think is a massively great call, but you know, I was pretty, pretty on the money. And I do think I have them losing the grand final in this prediction, but we'll get to that. So the Giants are the iffy one there. Again, you know, it's the same point I made uh, about the Saints. It's not just about list talent, but I think the way they play football and adhering to a really strong and compelling game plan that makes me back in GWS. Do they have the second best list on talent? I wouldn't say so. Like I'd, I'd say Collingwood probably have them covered in that regard. But they do have superstars, an unheralded backline. It's not even just your obvious ones like Tom Green, Toby Green, Sam Taylor, Stephen Keneally, or Josh Kelly. Like there's there's so much depth to this team. There's less heralded guys. I know Connor Iden's starting to get a bit of a profile now. Lockie Ash is another one worth mentioning. Finn Callahan could take his game to the next level. Buckley towards the end of the season. I think they've really consolidated their depth. There's talent there. And there's a really compelling game style. And I think GWS could genuinely go all the way this year. I was very strong on the Giants. Um, they did finish fourth, which isn't a million miles from where I predicted. But they weren't quite the same team that I expected this year. And it was a weird year where they actually worked out their home and away performance and were poor in finals, or at least, you know, ultimate chokes. <laughs> I honestly think they left a flag on the table when you consider the two teams they choked big leads against, played off in the grand final, and things could have so easily been different with, you know, just one more goal in either game. But I digress. It, um, you know, I, I was not a million miles off, but I did think they were going to be a better team than they were, so I slightly overrated them. Okay, so Brisbane, I think, speaks for itself. I don't really foresee any obvious drop-off with them. I don't think they're super vulnerable to injury. I think they've got reasonably good depth. They've got a productive forward line, a sound back line, and a midfield that wins clearances. I don't really see too many deficiencies there. Sure, losing a grand final could rattle them, but under Fagan, for four years or whatever it's been, we've seen a consistently good home and away team. So they'll at least get in that mix. If they've got finals at the Gabba, I think they're a 100% chance to win the whole thing and probably my top team going into this year. That's my prediction. In first place, I had Brisbane. Um, I won't back Pat too much because I didn't have them winning the flag. However, um, I rated them good enough to be around that mark. Um, ironically, it's flipped around. Their finals run was ultimately the amazing part of their season. And their home and away season was good, but they did miss the top four. So not an amazing prediction and certainly not one you can really pat yourself on the back for too much because Brisbane have been a wonderfully consistent side for a number of years. So I rated them. I'm sure everyone did. Not a million miles off. But I'm, I am glad I didn't predict them to fall down the ladder too hard because we all know what happened against Sydney in the grand final. For the grand final, I'm going to say we could see an all-Sydney grand final and that the Giants will win their first AFL Premiership. Uh, that's kind of just my ballsy prediction there. I think there are five 
to seven teams that could win the premiership. I've included two of them outside my top eight. I know this is ridiculous. We'll run through the awards. Brownlow medal. I tip a tie every year and I'm going to do it again because statistically it's got to happen soon. Nick Dacos and Sam Walsh share the award. What a story that would be. Rivals from Collingwood and Carlton. If you look at the way Nick Dacos polled last year, you can't possibly bet against them in my opinion. So again, it's obviously comes down to injury and I think Sam Walsh is at the point of his career. He's going to take his game to the next level and fully arrive as this top line level talent. I'm backing him in. For the Coleman, I think I said this in the video the other day, I think it's time for Max King. I think St. Kilda will get more entries inside 50 this year. He kicked 28 goals from 11 last year. I think they'll improve as a team if their efficiency inside 50 can improve. Max King is waiting to win his first Coleman this year. And the rising star, I mentioned in the video the other day, I'm going to double down on Colby McKercher, who will rack up 28 disposals a game or something silly, use the ball well. He's got blistering speed. He is going to be the rising star. So yeah, summarizing that, Giants beat Sydney in the grand final. I did talk about that in mid-year, how I was campaigning for that to happen. So I could sit here during this video and say, look guys, I was right. Uh, but the Giants choked, they really did. But I got one half of the grand final correct, I suppose. Um, Walsh and Dacos tied Brownlow. Yeah, Walsh didn't quite have the same, or well, the season that I was expecting. Um, you know, a bit of a bold call that one. Dacos did finish second, but Patrick Cripps obviously won by a mile. And Max King for Coleman probably wasn't the best call. Colby McCurch for Rising Star. Um, yeah, that, that one's always really hard to predict, to be honest. I can't remember exactly where he finished, but I think he was in the top five at least. So he wasn't a million miles off, but never would have seen Ollie Dempsey coming. Probably wouldn't have really considered Sam Darcy a top contender either. Darcy Wilson also exceeded my expectations. So that one was a hard one to read, but McCurch, you know, he had a pretty good first year. All right, guys, that was a lot of fun. Honestly, I think that I know there was a couple of howlers in there and a few ones that I probably don't give myself too much credit for getting right but I think on balance that was one of the best attempts I've done at a ladder prediction for some time and I think it might be off the back of that series I did at the end of last year where I analyzed every team's best 22 in their immediate depth and I do think I went into this year with a bit more understanding now football's a funny game and you're still going to get most predictions wrong so I'm going to intend to do that again this year and I fully expect to get my predictions awfully wrong next year because that's the way the football goes but we'll see did it have something to do with me getting better calls this year I don't know but let me know in the comments what you thought of this video and I'll see you in the next one guys cheers